Today's lecture is Agora Acropolis Grid. Uh, last lecture, we discussed the formation of this new kind of political space. Um, I speculated that, um, that the theater, actually the Greek theater, the religious space, may have been the armature, may have been an analogous structure into which this new kind of, this new conception of a new kind of space uh, was mapped. Uh, that space is the Agora, and as the Agora develops over a long period of time, uh, quite complex and altogether over eight or nine hundred years, almost a thousand years of, of building, uh, the main elements are the municipal buildings that we see here, the stoa or market buildings that we see along here, uh, monuments and memorials that we see here, for example, to the ten eponymous heroes. Um, the boundary stones that we see marking the corners. Water supply and sewer. Water and sewer. Now, at the same time that the Agora is developing down here in this flat area over a long period of time, slowly the Acropolis, the old Mycenaean city, the citadel of the city, is converted into a sort of memorial district associated with religious functions and with the protection of um, the city as a whole from the patronage of the goddess Athena. And thus, um, Athens takes on then the sort of, in its mature form, the characteristics of all these Hellenic and later Hellenistic cities and that is a sort of two part major two major parts of public building. The first is the political and economic center uh, of the city, the Agora, and the second is the uh, memorial district, religious district, uh, which becomes the high city or the Acropolis. The Acropolis, which literally means Acropolis, the high city, could of course be fortified in time of attack. And, and could function as a citadel, but its function in the day-to-day -day life of the city was as uh, a memorial and district. Other political spaces, such as the Penix, will develop that we see over here, and then housing, which we will see in a minute, uh, sort of fills in the interstitial space. All of this is connected via a large avenue, today what we might call an avenue, a via, a way, which is called the Panathenaic Way, or the dromos, the part in a ritual that is associated with action. Uh, it literally, in its root, it means to walk or to run. <coughs> so if we look at the city of Athens, then we see the walls loosely flung about the city, uh, to quote R.E. Weicherly, indicating that they, in fact, came after uh, the process of settlement. And we see from the sacred gate and the Thria gate, often referred to as a singular dipylon gate, uh, this main street sort of moving through the Agora and up the Aeropagus um, in the saddle between the Aeropagus and the Acropolis to the Acropolis. Everything else is then infilled uh, with housing and so forth. And this is more or less what the city would have looked like at the time, let's say, that the Parthenon was built in the age of Pericles, in the sort of peak period of the classical Greek city before all of the democratic institutions collapsed and we have the takeover by Alexander the Great from Macedon, Macedonia in the north, who ultimately uh, expands eastward. He's not interested in the west, he expands eastward. Um, and that marks the beginning of what is referred to by historians as the Hellenistic period, typically referring to cities in Turkey and in Syria and in even Jordan and as far, in fact, as Pakistan, there were Greek temples. So the Acropolis looks today something like what we see down here um, on the lower photograph in this uh, sort of beautiful but imaginary reconstruction from the 19th century uh, showing this cult statue of Athena hanging up over everything with the propylia, the gate into um, uh, flanked by the Temple of Athena Nike, the little Ionic temple that we see uh, right here, 
and then, of course, the house of the goddess. Now, let me pause here for a moment and speak about temples because um, the way that um, if you, there's a very high probability that all of you, um, at least culturally, grew up in a world which is derived from the Abrahamic religions. Most of you did. Not all of you, but most of you. And those would be um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all of which claim descendancy from um, Abraham. So I'm calling them the Abrahamic religions. The, um, all of those are congregational religions, meaning that you meet as a group like this, right? Um, now, we've seen the, in the rituals of Dionysus, these were congregational gatherings as well in the rituals. But the high gods, the gods that occupied, like Athena, that occupied the Parthenon, um, weren't always there. You didn't worship inside the building, right? It was uh, sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek, but I tend to think of these as birdhouses. You know, you build a birdhouse, and you sort of try to make the birdhouse very attractive, and you put out a little food, maybe a little suet, uh, a little sacrifice of some sort for the bird in the hopes that the bird will come. So the first thing you would do if you were Greek is do what? You would build a temple because you want the protection of the god or the goddess over uh, the territory that you occupy. This will become significant as we move to Rome because in the Roman mind, it is the reverse of that, okay? The city itself comes first. The walls then are constructed on down to Piraeus, which is, according to tradition, laid out the port of Athens, which is laid out by an interesting man named Hippodamus. And we will see Hippodamus here in just a moment, Hippodamus of Miletus. Uh, the housing, as I said, was sort of the infill area. Athens, which grew not from any single organized plan, such as Cahoon or Tel El Amarna, or any of the Egyptian uh, cities that we looked at, but rather by a process of accretion. That is, it is growing on the margins uh, a block at a time. And so we see irregular streets. We see houses which do not always have orthogonal geometry. And it's an indication when we see that that the city is growing by a process of accretion, one project, one block, one element at a time. This is the placa, which is really the medieval part of, of Athens. And as I mentioned the other day, uh, although these buildings are much, much, much later, the classical city still lies underneath them. And I would be willing to bet that if we were to clear this area and excavate it, we would find remarkable uh, concordance between uh, the pattern of streets that we see here, the pattern of housing that we see here, and housing back in uh, the ancient city, but we cannot excavate there because uh, we can't displace all these people. So we don't know. And the few places where excavations have occurred and houses have been discovered, uh, they look a little bit like this. These are 5th century houses, 5th century before the Common Era, houses west of the Areopagus in Athens. And we see them built around a courtyard, this ancient building type, uh, typical, actually, of the eastern Mediterranean, as well as, uh, not typical of Egypt, but typical of um, the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as Mesopotamia, and all through today, what we call the Middle East, is all built around this courtyard. Now, interestingly enough, as we will see in the Roman world, um, as the Roman world begins to develop, and a lot of Greek influence comes in, interestingly enough, they begin to add garden rooms that are built around a courtyard, which are called peristyle, peristyle uh, which is really the living room of the house, even though no house ever excavated in the classical Hellenic Greek world has ever shown planting in the courtyard. It was never a garden. It was always paved, and it was associated uh, with the household work. Often there would be a well or some other um, element within it, but the rooms come off of, um, of that courtyard, and typically there is a party wall condition where the houses join uh, with no space in between the party wall. But if we look at this, what we can see is that the irregular street that we have here, this opening up into this kind of vestibule that then opens up into a courtyard, the same thing here with a kind of vestibule that then opens up into a courtyard here with some sort of a reception room or so forth here. Now, 
I mentioned Hippodamus of Miletus. Uh, Miletus is an Ionian city, meaning that it is, in fact, um, in what is today Turkey. And if we look at this, there are two cities that we will talk about here. There are more than two uh, worth talking about, but we will talk about two. That is um, Miletus that we see here and Priene that we see here. Um, there was a natural harbor in the ancient world that we see here with a few islands in the center that was actually the delta of an interesting river that called the Meander. It's where our word meander actually comes from, meaning that it's moving uh, in its course. The Meander uh, carried a lot of silt with it, and it silted in this harbor. And eventually there we see the Hellenistic and Roman periods. So Priene is already now without harbor, and later Miletus uh, is silted in as well, so that the modern shore is actually out here in the Aegean. Um, there were hundreds of cities in this part of the world, uh, but these are of particular importance because um, uh, they are associated with um, what's called Hippodamian planning. Uh, Hippodamus, who the Greeks credited with the invention of formal city planning, that is, the planning of cities and colonies that they were familiar with, um, what we know about him comes from Aristotle, and he gets the credit for inventing the grid plan. Did he invent the grid plan? No. We've seen that earlier. We, we didn't look, but it's in the PowerPoint at Mohenjo-Daro, which was more or less in, in the Indus Valley, which was a grid plan 2500 BCE. Uh, the same thing in Egypt, very old cities, which were, in fact, organized as planned cities with orthogonal geometry on a grid, where each individual building is a subdivision of a larger whole. Um, nonetheless, the Greeks were not aware of this, and so they credited their ancestor with the invention of the grid, Hippodamus of Miletus. He did not invent it, um, and the only thing we know about him is really what comes from, uh, from Aristotle. But Miletus was a center of learning, and it is here that Thales, um, T-H-A-L-E-S, Thales of Miletus in, sort of um, invented a school of philosophy and an academy which other uh, philosophers later, such as Plato and Pythagoras and others, um, would actually follow, Aristotle as well. Um, and when Miletus was excavated, it revealed a rigidly orthogonal plan based on two distinct but seemingly contemporary grids of uniform housing blocks. An older one at the, to the north, which was associated directly with this small harbor, this inlet that we see here with walls coming down to close it off in time of attack. And then uh, down here, a second city that developed later with slightly larger blocks, and then the Acropolis or the citadel of the city, which, which was up here uh, on the hill. Um, it is probably of Bronze Age founding, although all of the excavations, uh, except for small amounts of, um, of, of Hittite and Minoan Bronze Age um, uh, material, actually the majority of the city is datable to about the 6th century the sort of classical period, the 6th century BCE. Um, I like what uh, Aristotle says in uh, Book 2, uh, Part 8, where he uh, tells us, in fact, that Hippodamus uh, uh, divided the city into three zones, into a sacred zone, a public zone, and a private zone, a kind of, a kind of zoning according to those buildings which were associated with their religion, uh, those buildings that were associated with the affairs of state and were used by the public or market buildings, and then finally private, uh, which would be basically the domestic, uh, the domestic parts. Um, according to Aristotle's description, um, he, he sounds like he must have been an architect, probably with a Princeton degree. That's a joke. Um, because some people thought he carried things too far indeed with his long hair, expensive ornaments, and the same cheap, warm clothing worn all winter and all summer. That's a joke because there was a period back about 10 years ago when all these architects in New York wore nothing but black. You know, if you came in with a white shirt, you weren't really legit. That was sort of a joke. Okay. So if we zoom in on this, on the northern city, what we see then are the um, market functions that are occurring here right at the harbor. And then it opens up here into a large kind of agora space with a district over here that is associated, in fact, 
uh, with entertainment that we see um, up here with the, with the theater. By this time, I should mention, the theater has become secularized and is to, to a substantial degree um, divorced from the Dionysian um, rituals that are archaic. Um, in a detailed look, we see the Prytaneion. They had a slightly different uh, form of government, the, 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 um, the sort of ruler who was elected by a council that met in the bull, the bull being the council of the elders, um, sort of equivalent to a senate, uh, elected a leader. And so this became uh, sort of the, um, the, the, the executive branch of government, the person who was really like the president. He was in charge of things. And this is the Prytaneion. And the functions that had to do with import, export, tax, other kinds of things would be carried out through the Prytaneion. And then we see down here the council house, the Buletarian, again in that theatrical space uh, with a courtyard attached to it, which is called a palestra. And I think over the long weekend, parenthetically, I will try to put up some key words for you to you know, Prytaneion, Buletarion, so forth, so that you can study that. Um, it doesn't, you don't have to remember everything. Uh, and the South Market, which is occurring in this large, open, agora-like space, but has stoas all the way around it. Again, a reconstruction drawing showing that harbor coming in. This is actually the Prytaneion that we see right over here. And then we see the market buildings, or the stoa, the long stoa here facing out onto the market. There we see it as we move in, very formally planned, planned with clear intent um, to be organized and zoned in a particular way. Now, Priene uh, was constructed a much smaller city. Um, Miletus had a fairly large population, uh, possibly as much as 10 to 15,000 people, uh, tiny by our standards, but fairly large uh, at this time. Priene was a city of about 5,000 people, and it was actually uh, the second city that was built. It moved up the slope uh, from the harbor, which kept flooding, and was constructed almost entirely in its current form uh, in the middle of the 4th century BCE and was intended to be um, an ideal city. Following these Hippodamian principles, um, so it was zoned up into a political district, which consisted of the Buletarian and Prytaneion, the cultural district, which included the theater, some temples, and memorial functions, the commercial district with the agora and the stoas, and then a religious district, which contained sanctuaries dedicated to Zeus, Demeter, who's the mother of Persephone, sort of the female equivalent of Dionysus, and most importantly, the temple of Athena. The town had six main streets, about very wide, about 20 feet wide, that's very wide for the time, running east and west, and 15 streets, about 3 meters, that's about 10 feet, um, crossing at right angles, all being evenly spaced, and was divided then into about 80 blocks. Private houses were apportioned 8 to a block. So again, the plan is projected as a whole cloth, and then the individual houses are built as a subdivision uh, of that larger unit. Okay. This is an image of the Bulletarian. It's surprising, perhaps, how small it is on the lower left. And then we see the religious district here with the Temple of Athena. Uh, this is sort of benched into the hillside. Specialized markets down here for fish and other things. And then the main market that we see here with the stoa, durable goods, back in these stalls, opening up through this colonnade with a large set of steps opening out into this large agora space with uh, an altar in the center, and then the theater that we see relocated here. Now, if we move off of this into these 80 blocks, which we will in a minute, this is just a detail of the agora. Moving, and I'm sorry, I thought we were going to the residential blocks. This is the reconstruction of the Buletarian or the council house where the council of elders met to pass laws. If we move into these uh, 80 housing blocks, we see some fairly elaborate housing, much better than what we would see in Athens, for example. Um, the uh, upper left 
photograph that we see here is showing sort of the areas that have been excavated. There are those broad 20-foot streets, main streets opening in, and then the crossing streets that we see here. So that the houses fronted uh, these main streets that we see here with these secondary streets coming down the hillside with a very elaborate sewer system, system of drainage. Uh, these houses are, they conform to some degree, uh, the, the parts are the same, but they are arranged in different ways, and that is that you have a workshop, there's the courtyard that you see here, you enter into that court, there's a workshop that we, off the side street, there's a workshop that we see here which also opened out onto the main street, and then we have the porch and uh, the living part of the house here, ecos, that means the living room, and um, then a second story, porch, and there we see a ladder sort of going up to this mezzanine level, which is getting us up to, there it is right there, getting us up to this uh, second story. Now that makes an interesting comparison. I want to uh, go back here. We, we're going to compare then uh, two similar um, cities, uh, Priene and Olynthus. Olynthus also planned as a whole cloth, a very old city that probably is again of Bronze Age origin but which eventually developed uh, according to these Hippodamian principles. And Olynthus, this, is, this house that we see here on the right is from Olynthus, and this house that we see on the left, of uh, different dimension, is in fact from Priene. So if we look at Olynthus, what we see in the Acropolis is the old Mycenaean city, and it resembles very much like what we saw at Mycenae. Um, and then we see an agora, again like Athens, down in the flat area that we tentatively been identified as Nogora, uh, but what is of most interest here are the housing blocks, which are clearly uh, part of a subdivision of a larger unit, which was the city that was planned as a whole at some point in time. The streets projected out into a regular orthogonal grid uh, of blocks that were 300 feet on a face and uh, 120 feet in depth. So there you see these individual houses. Uh, this is three hundred. This is a three hundred foot block, and this is a one hundred and twenty foot block. That's in English feet, American feet. Um, the um, this number three hundred feet will appear again and again. Uh, one twenty will as well. In fact, the number sixty, sixty foot dimension, will appear again and again across time, space, and culture. Um, I suspect it has something to do with the human body and the projection of the human body into space, right, that we find certain dimensions being more useful than others. The tithing blocks of Savannah, Georgia, when they were laid out in 1933, were five 60-foot uh, lots forming uh, a 300-foot block. Uh, 60 feet, the lot depth was 90 feet, and so on, so that you then have subdivisions of 20 and 30 that become very useful as time goes on because um, you can convert those dimensions. They're easily convertible to different uh, uses, to adapt those dimensions to different uses. And it's interesting to me that, that they appear here in Olynthus sometime in the middle of the 5th century uh, BCE. So if we look at the structure of this, then what we have is uh, 300 by 120 foot blocks with wide streets uh, that the houses opened onto. Uh, there are party wall conditions, uh, unlike um, Priene, where um, the sides, the, each one of these blocks is subdivided by a side street. This way, we have an alley, a kind of service alley, that is running behind, through the block, behind these five subdivisions, these five houses, with the houses fronting out onto the main street. Uh, it's very similar to what we will see in Philadelphia. It's very similar to what we see in Savannah and so forth. The houses themselves, again, contain all of the elements that we see at Priene as well as in Athens, but they are arranged in a different way, this orthogonal uh, geometry. You entered here into a courtyard uh, off the street. There's a little vestibule that we see here, and then into a sort of large, um, living room or courtyard which functioned as a kind of family room with individual rooms off the side including a kitchen and uh, a toilet even. These houses had, had water supply, wells and cisterns taking roof water and putting it into tanks underground to use for domestic water supply. Um, 
So if we compare Olynthus on the right to 5th century houses west of the Areopagus in Athens, what we see is a very similar house plan, but um, it looks like one sort of grew, to use Morris's term, organically, even though it's no such thing as an organic house. It actually um, uh, is growing by a process of accretion. So the walls are not orthogonal because they're trying to accommodate uh, existing patterns of streets, existing patterns of buildings that they are trying to fit into, um, growing on the margin. Whereas at Olynthus, uh, all we have to do is go back to this to see that, in fact, each house, each one of these, is a subdivision of a larger plan. Now, as I mentioned, Alexander the Great, um, uh, in around 330 uh, BCE, 300 BCE, uh, comes in and takes over after, fills the vacuum after this direct democracy in Athens has collapsed. He unifies all of Greece and establishes what today we would call an empire. More when we get to Rome or what that word means. Um, but he moved south and he moved east. He was not interested in the west at all. Um, that has always puzzled me a little bit, but it tells you where the wealth was. The wealth was in Egypt. The wealth was in Syria. The wealth was in um, Babylonia. The wealth was in India. Uh, it was not, in fact, in, uh, in the western Mediterranean. Prior to that, going all the way back to the beginning of the classical period, going all the way back to about 600 BCE, however, Greek cities, these poli, these polises, um, had begun uh, a process of colonization, both in North Africa, Tripoli, in what is now Libya, for example, capital of Libya, uh, that P-O-L-I, poli, tri-city, right? The poli indicates that it was a Greek founding, a Greek colony. Uh, he established hundreds of cities, Alexandria in Egypt being one of them. Um, and then um, more of more interest to us in the context of this course, um, cities like Corinth and others sent colonies to what is um, to, to Italy, to the Italian peninsula, including Naples, which was Neapolis, uh, as well as Metapontum and other cities along uh, the southern coast. And we can actually still see embedded in some of the names of present towns in Italy, such as Agropoli here, that this was a city of Greek founding. Now, um, they, just a map, not all of them, but it gives you a sense of where these colonies were established. And they tended to be uh, spun out of, so Corinth would establish Metapontum, Metapontum would grow to a certain size, they would send out another colony, and they would establish, for example, Posidonia. So it was um, a sort of continuing process of expansion of Greek influence. We know about Alexander in the east and his generals, Ptolemy and Seleucid and so forth. Uh, but in the west, it, these were individual colonies that were established by these individual city-states that became autonomous. Uh, they were not um, subject to the rule of the parent colony. They were autonomous. They kept to the shoreline. The Greek world was interested in, it was a maritime civilization. It was interested in the sea. It was not interested in the mountains. It was not interested in the interior. And uh, the, uh, fortunately for these colonists, the indigenous Italic tribes that lived, uh, lived in the mountains and lived in these hills were not interested in the sea. Uh, they were not interested in the ocean at all, as a matter of fact. And uh, so a sort of uh, happy convenience arose where there was not a great deal of conflict. In fact, they became useful to one another because products that were grown in the hills could then be exported and so on and so forth um, and vice versa. There, there was a means to do that because of these uh, Greek colonies. So the Greeks stayed pretty much in the south of Italy and they stayed along uh, the shore and on Sicily. Uh, Two-thirds of Sicily was Greek, cities like Syracuse and others. Plato, for example, lived um, on, on, on um, 
uh, Sicily. And um, did I say Crete? I, I meant Sicily. I'm sorry. Sicily, okay? Um, Plato lived on Sicily. And um, Pythagoras, uh, all of you geometricians here, certainly familiar with him, um, lived here at Metaponto. Uh, there are ruins of these that remain, uh, such as the theater here at Metapontum, uh, as well as the Temple of Hera. And there was agricultural territory uh, associated with each of these cities, such as um, what we see here. So Metapontum laid out on these Hippodamian principles that we see here. Not much of it remains. Um, and then these lines that we see out in the fields, which are called Cora. The Cora were the agricultural settlements that were affiliated with the colony. These actually also indicate uh, centralized planning because um, they were orthogonal, they were regular, they were subdivided from larger plots. Larger plots became smaller plots by halving, and there we see that again. This is, these are the dimensions here in, um, I guess, meters, yes. Um, so I want to focus here on this area. This is about as far north as the Greeks got, the oldest uh, known Greek inscription, the Euboan, a Euboan Greek inscription has been found on the island of Ischia, just, just outside the Bay of Naples. Uh, the cities that we see here at Kumai, Naples, Tori, today, Tora, the Tower of the Greeks, uh, as well as Herculano, Herculaneum, and so forth were all Greek cities, as was this city here, um, the city of using the Latin name, the Roman name, Paestum. Paestum makes a great uh, example. It was the Greek city of Posidonia. It was a colony of, um, of um, Metapontum. And again, it had agricultural territory associated with it, tied back to uh, the city. And the city, uh, about what you see shaded at dark here, is actually the part of the city that has been uh, excavated. Uh, there is a, th this is actually backwards, and the sanctuary of Hera should be the sanctuary of Athena, and the sanctuary of Athena should be the sanctuary of Hera. This is Hera, and this is um, Athena. And how Dieter Mertens could have gotten that backwards, I don't know. We'll see these long sort of blocks, which are typical of the Greek cities, and then we notice the insertion here of something else, which is a forum. Uh, this is indicating a Roman insertion, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between um, the way the Greeks conceived of cities and the way the Romans conceived of cities. But before we do that, these are the walls that are still there, complete with 6th century B.C. towers dating to 500, 550 um, B.C.E. And then we see today a modern highway that is sort of cut through the middle of it, that unfortunately cut part of the amphitheater and part of the forum off and separated this territory that we see from the part that has been excavated here. The walls, there are the walls, they are still intact. And originally the ocean was here. It's now about a mile away. The river, in fact, has uh, silted in. And there we see the, um, the excavations uh, from the air. This line that we see here this red line is the orientation of the Greek city. There we see it in the Temple of Hera II and the Temple of Hera I. And then we notice a black line here, which is the orientation of the Roman city. And over the next week, we will come to understand why the Romans rotated that around. It was part of their religion, and it was associated with the inauguration and founding of towns. As I mentioned, if you were Greek, the first thing you did was to establish a temple. Um, Hera, the mother of the gods associated with the earth, and Poseidon, the god of the sea, they hated each other, these two gods. They were constantly fighting. And my guess is these colonists were trying to hedge their bets. So they named the town after Poseidon, and they uh, built a temple to Hera. Now, peculiarly, we don't know why, but uh, they, uh, they didn't abandon this temple, but they uh, built a second temple to Hera. Maybe something had gone wrong. We don't know. A second temple to Hera uh, adjacent to that. 
The second thing I want to mention about this is that when we see these buildings today, uh, we see them standing as bare bones uh, out in the middle of a pasture, out in the middle of a grass lawn. That was not how they would have been perceived um, at the time they were built. In fact, you can see a little bit of artificial topography here, a sort of valley in between that is not simply for drainage. There were walls, sanctuaries built around these, and the worship occurred outdoors here on the altar where a sacrifice would be made, the idea being that you would burn a chicken wing and it would go up to heaven, and uh, Hera would say, well, that smells pretty good. I better go check on my folks down there, you know, and she would come into the temple for a while, and um, you would pour out a little wine and so forth uh, called a libation on the ground as well. Um, let me advance this. So um, a couple of the elements that are interesting within um, the Greek elements, within the, um, the city of Poseidonia, which will convert in the third century to the city of Paestum, is the Heroon. This is uh, the symbolic tomb of the founder. Some of you have been there, I would assume, and you've heard the discussion. But for those of you who have not, let me um, point out that um, this was, when this was discovered, they, they thought that they had uncovered the grave because it was in the city. They thought they had uncovered the tomb of the founder, perhaps, because only the founder could be, or a, or a god could be associated inside the walls of the city. No burials inside the wall of the city. Well, very carefully, they cracked this roof tile and went into this, looking sort of like a doghouse, went into this, and guess what they found? Another one of these, like one of those Russian dolls, right? Box within a box. So they very carefully removed one of those tiles and went in, and guess what they found? Was there anybody in there? No. Six beautiful bronze urns about this big with clots of honey in them. They had buried urns filled with honey. Why? You tell me. No one knows. But uh, they recovered them. They're actually in a museum there today. Uh, then they very carefully reassembled the roof tile. This had an enclosure around it, as we see here, similar to the temples. This was a sacred space, and this is a timenos, or a place cut out from the secular world uh, as being sacred. Um, the main street that we see here eventually opened up into an agora, um, and in the Agora, or adjacent to the uh, Agora, was a large round space called an Ecclesiasterion. When the Romans came in, they slightly realigned everything, leaving all of the Greek uh, religious buildings and public buildings intact, but they abandoned um, the Ecclesiasterion and actually built a comitium that we see here. The comitium is then the place of assembly. Our word committee comes from that, and we will explore the comitium much later when we get to Rome. Sanctuary of Athena, there we see just a, a hint of the wall that would have gone around it. This topography is artificially built up. Um, the Greek temple, of course, sitting on its stylobate all around on the highest point that it possibly could, could be made. It's quite beautiful. And uh, those trees, by the way, are the Pinus pinea. That's what pine nuts come from. So the next time you eat pine nuts, now you know where they came from. And if you're interested in these issues, uh, there is a program that I started 20 years ago uh, that is now run by Dr. Thanos Ekonomou. It is available to all students at Georgia Tech. Uh, we take about 22 a year, spending two weeks and two and a half weeks in the Greek world, uh, southern Italy, and then two weeks in Rome, and then two weeks in Florence and Venice. Uh, it is... Um, it's a heck of a deal because you could never actually see all that or do all that on your own for anywhere near the amount of money that it costs. Um, I'm no longer associated with this. Last year was my last go-around. But others, um, others uh, Laura Hollingreen, Thanos Ekonomou, um, Leroy Andriotti, others uh, professors at Georgia Tech are. It is a great program, and I highly uh, recommend it. So I am, um, I talked to Thanos about this last night, and 
he asked me to put in a blatant commercial for the program, so I'm doing that now, okay? If you have any interest in this, let me know, and uh, we will, I can t tell you who to contact and how to go about doing it. Um, we finished about three minutes early today, so uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have about anything we've discussed. When we come back from your break, we will be looking at the founding of Roman cities, which were very different in the way there are certain similarities, but conceptually they were very, very different. Um, and we will go through that in some detail um, as we go through the next four lectures. The, so I don't want to keep you in too much suspense. The Greek colonies, um, would, there's a quote in here that you'll see on one of these slides from the Chias on the shores of, uh, I believe, Syracuse, Syracuse. It says, you are the city, not the ships and the walls. You, the people, the deme, you are the city. Whereas in the Roman world, there were no Romans until there was a city called Rome. And every Roman colony was, in a sense, a little model of Rome, all of them. They built thousands upon thousands of cities, literally, many of which still remain, many of which go on to become very famous cities in the world. Um, as I mentioned the other day, London is one, York, England is one, Winchester is one, Paris, Lyon, Barcelona, um, Cordoba, uh, Sevilla, um, Milan, Florence, uh, Vienne, um, cities in Algeria, Morocco, Jerusalem, actually. The old city of Jerusalem is, was torn down and rebuilt by the Romans in 130 A.D. And on and on. They built thousands of these. Hundreds of them still remain. So we will spend a good bit of time on Rome. We are, after all, using their alphabet. All right? So it becomes, it behooves us to understand if we're going to find out where 5th and West Peachtree comes from, because no matter where it started out, by the time it comes to anything in what we would call Western civilization, North and South America, Europe, much of North Africa, anything west of the Himalayas bears an indelible Roman stamp. Uh, it was strained through a Roman filter. didn't matter where it started out. Okay? Any questions at all? No questions. Well, have a great Labor Day weekend, and I will see you in here on Wednesday. And uh, I hope we don't have to um, do a seating chart and take roll, but if we can't, you know. <laughs>